Hi folks, welcome back to Water Child Tarot. My name is Sarah and thanks for joining me today. Um, this is a video that I've been thinking about doing in a couple different formats and I finally decided to just kind of combine a couple different topics into one. So today I want to look at different PIP systems. Um, and I don't uh, really consider um, things like the RWS or the Thoth or the Marseille uh, different systems of tarot. I see them all as flavors of the same thing. But what I have noticed, uh, especially in my historical decks, and then comparing some of those to modern decks inspired by historical decks, is that there are some distinct uh, categories of pip arrangements that I can identify. And so I just wanted to explore those a little bit today. I don't really have a conclusion about them necessarily. I just think it's interesting that different artists over the years have decided to arrange the pips in a different way. And so if you're not familiar with tarot, I will uh, just say that the pips um, here refer to the one through 10 of each of the four minor suits. So um, that's what we're gonna be looking at today. And I want to start out with what would commonly be known as the Marseille pattern, but we're actually going to look at two non-Marseille decks. So this uh, Taroki Rosenwald reproduction by Heather Hall is based on an early Italian deck, and this Tarot de Maria Celia is a modern TDM style deck by Leonard Jim Narciso. This is produced by US Games. And the hallmark, I think, of this pattern in particular is that you distinguish between the swords cards have a curvilinear uh, look to them and then the wands are straight. So I'm just going to run through really quickly here and we can see um, these similarities. So here we have the swords and we have this curved shape and then we have flourishes around and we can look and see that the traditional uh, Rosenwald was very bare bones. It didn't have a lot of flourishes in it. Um, again, they were printing on wood blocks, so they were having to carve every single thing out of a block of wood, which is difficult. And if you, you know, chip an ornament, then you have to go back and start all over again. So they're, they're fairly plain compared with these guys over here, which represent a more, you know, maybe later 15th or 16th century for something like the Rosenwald or similar decks, then you get into the 18th and 19th centuries around Marseille and other parts of France and also Switzerland where they were producing decks with uh, these more elaborative uh, features. So I think this is interesting, at least it is to me, just to see how these are similar and different, but how they follow this basic pattern in the swords and then in the wand suit. So here we have wands. This is a very um, classically Italian look to the wands where it actually looks like a sawed off branch or a piece of a tree. This is a little bit more stylized. And often the aces are slightly different than the others. So you can see here that in both of these we have a different style in the ace of batons or wands than we do in the subsequent uh, numbers. But again, we have these uh, characteristic flourishes with the flowers and leaves, and then here we have just a very plain setup. But you can see that the way that the pips are arranged in terms of what overlaps what and how they're put on here, that they are the same. And when you're reading Marseille, you know, there are some techniques that talk about the arrangement of the flourishes along with the other items. So I'll, I'll talk about that more in just a second. Now here you can see a difference in the 10. You have two, so you have the eight crossing, then you have the two vertical, and here you have one vertical, one horizontal. So they're not identical, but they're so similar, and I think they come from a very similar tradition. Here we have this elaborate cup, the Ace of Cups, and this is very Italian, classically Italian. It's a, a goblet or a giant urn or vase with flowers. This is, I would say, a little bit more French style with this built up kind of castle looking ace. And then in the Swiss style, you actually have something that looks like a giant jello mold that's big and round and it has decoration on it. So there are regional variations as well. Now, the um, I did notice that the cups and the pentacles are not necessarily as consistent with the older decks and then some of these like you know, middle age, middle tarot age decks, like 17th and 18th century. So this is kind of interesting too, to see 
you know, the, okay, you have the four, two on the top, two on the bottom, but here you have all this foliage. So they're not identical, but they do have a lot in common. Here we have five with four around the corners and then one in the middle. And I would say this 10 is pretty classic Marseille here with the three rows of three and then one at the top uh, on its side. This one is a little bit different. I actually like this arrangement a little bit better. Leonard Jim Narciso has come up with a creative solution to how to arrange 10 items there. And finally, the coin suit. And the animals here on this ace are similar to another deck that I'll talk about in just a second. And you can see that the Rosenwald is going to be very, very plain in this suit. It is just a number of coins arranged. Um, now what I was mentioning before is that some people will read a Marseille and they'll read into the arrangement of the flowers and the coins. For example here we have you know maybe a walled garden with three entities that are each separated from each other or perhaps these two entities have brought these vines in in order to protect and nurture this third thing. So people will sort of assign um, an emotional or philosophical significance sometimes, and that can be useful. It can certainly help you if you're feeling stuck, if you're not getting a lot of intuitive hits in a particular reading, you can kind of um, look at the arrangement and try to make visual connections between things. I don't mind plain pips these days. I can always fall back on my numerology for that. But at the same time, if you had a spread and it had a lot of these plain cards in it, it might be just a little boring to sort of look at. So I can go, I can appreciate both of these for different reasons. Um, but there are a lot of similarities too, like how these are arranged. All right, so that is our first example, which I'll call our classic Marseille pattern. Next up, we have another early deck. This is the Tarot of Paris, which is attributed to the mid 1600s. And it has its own kind of pattern. The only other historic deck that I've seen that has a similar pattern is the Tarot Neoclassico. I don't know if that was the original title of that deck, but um, it is published by Il Minighello under that title, and I believe Los Scarabeo may have also published a version of it. I'll link to at least one video and maybe more down in the com in the um, notes below. Uh, Marilyn of Tarot Clarity has recently done a video on the Neoclassico and also Tom Benjamin has featured it in a couple of his videos. So the Neoclassico is an Italian deck. Uh, this one, as the name implies, is from Paris. We don't know who the original card maker was because the where their name would appear has been left blank, but it's in that time period, the same time period as your Dodal and your Noble, I believe. Again, printed on woodblock and what we have here is a facsimile from the Library of Paris, the National Library, and so it has the problems of facsimile decks, which is blurry ink, faded colors, it has this museum stamp on every single card. So I would love a better quality deck, and I love this deck for its unique approach to pips. It's not singular in that regard, and one deck that I realized recently, and one of the reasons I got this recently, that has pip design in common is this. It's called the Dinosaur de Marseille. And this is published independently by a woman named Anastasia Kashin. She's out of Wales. And I was able to order this through her Etsy shop. I'll link below. As you can see, it's a few years old now, but in 2018. I think she originally kickstarted it, but you can get it through an online purchase. And what I noticed was the heavy influence of the Terra Paris on her deck. So it's interesting to me that she chose uh, the name Dinosaur de Marseille when really it should be called something else to reflect the influence of these pips. So in this deck, the ferns are the swords. So I'm starting in the same order and we can immediately see that there are some differences. Now there's a hint of curvature here with these kind of, I don't know, pirate sabers or something, but they're not the hyper curved kind of swords that you find in the Marseille. And in arrangements like this, where you have two below and two above, the pattern is totally different. So I think this is really interesting. I will say that the Neoclassico, um, when we get to the clubs, um, has a different 
format. But yeah, as soon as I saw <laughs> I saw this resemblance, it kind of intrigued me. She's also picked up on the same colors, so you can see here that the yellow sword in the background that goes from left to right is the same as this fern here. Then the green sword that's in the middle of the pile that goes from right to left is like this fern, and then the blue uh, goes from bottom to top and that mimics this one. So she's really heavily kind of used this deck, I think, as inspiration. This deck specifically, not just other decks with this kind of pips, but this deck specifically in her choices. Here in some of the later cards, you get ferns over top of a different kind of leaf, but again, the leaf pattern and the coloring mimics the Terror of Paris. So I was sort of tickled with myself and feeling rather smart when I figured out what her source imagery was. Now she does vary on the aces. Um, I mentioned another deck with animals in the aces and, and that's this one. And so here we have some sort of griffin monkey creature. I'm not really sure what this is, but she goes more traditional with her aces. And so then we have these batons. And you'll see these are more log-like in the Tarot of Paris, and that's what the uh, batons or uh, bastoni are like in the Neoclassico as well. It's the same kind of log. And here she's used bones, long bones from dinosaurs as her kind of uh, batons, which I think is very clever. Her elemental associations are really good too here. Yeah, it, this just kind of tickled me. I went, wait a minute, that looks vaguely familiar. Where have I seen you know, that kind of pattern before. What does this look like? And it took me a minute, but uh, here you go. And she does add, obviously, flourishes and, and extra dinosaurs and things that are not in here. So again, this might appeal if you like more ornamentation. Um, here we have the cups suit, and she uses an underwater sea creature for her cups. Here we have some kind of unicorn. And then again, she varies a little bit in the placement on some of the suits. So here we have a top and bottom, and here we have a left and a right. That's a little bit more like a French deck, or, or a, a later French deck, I should say, a Marseille style. Same thing with the three. We have the two and the one, like we saw in the last, rather than the three stacked on top of each other. I like that the cups in the Tarot of Paris are all different from each other, and you get little things like faces and funny little ornaments and creatures in there as well. And then finally for our coins suit, we have ammonites which are a type of, another type of sea creature, but they're, they're round, they have this spiral shell, so I think it works well with coins. And you can see in so many places in this deck where it would say Paris, by, and then there would be room for the card maker's name, but there is no card maker's name. So this was like a blank set that should have been branded and was not branded. This is an interesting arrangement for the six as well. Normally it's two by two row. Seven is very similar. And this eight is a bit different. I, I usually see this kind of arrangement. So they're not exactly the same in all cards, but m predominantly similar. All right, so that's our mid-1600s kind of pattern. I did just mention that I have additional proof of influence over the, the Tarot of Paris over uh, this deck, the Dinosaurs de Marseille, and that's in the naming of the uh, pages or valets. It's spelled varlet, V-A-R-L-E-T, in the Tarot of Paris. That would be a misspelling and she has copied that. So all of her pages are also varlets. So I can see an influence. She doesn't mention it in the little booklet that comes with the deck, but it's definitely there. All right, for our next pip style, I want to introduce you, if you are not already aware, of the Yudas Picard system. And uh, he was an esotericist, and he published a tarot book 
uh, his own thoughts and writings on esoteric tarot specifically um, in 1909, which was the same year that the Rider Waite Smith uh, deck was originally published along with A.E. Waite's Pictorial Key. So he would have been a contemporary, but I don't know that he was influenced or anything uh, by Waite or that they would have known each other. I don't believe he was involved with the Golden Dawn. Um, to my, the best of my knowledge. He did study Eliphas Levy and Taya and all those sort of early classical esoteric writers, so they were both influenced um, by the same groups. And Picard sort of came away from all that writing saying, well, yeah, you've, you've spent a ton of time on the major arcana. What about the minors? You know, they're more than half the deck. Aren't they important? And for him, he saw a lot of significance and a lot of uh, Kabbalistic symbolism in the miners and decided to rearrange them to suit his his thoughts and approach to the tarot as an esoteric system. I do not have a copy of his deck. You can find decks that are influenced by him. And I will link to Kelly of The Truth in Story has a great long form video on a number of decks that were influenced by the Picard system. Those include El Gran Tarot Esoterico and then a couple of kind of mashup decks that Los Garabeo has published over the years. Um, and she talks about, she shows his original imagery and talks about his uh, symbolic inclusions in that. What I have for you today is Tarot Balbi, and this is the only Picard-influenced deck that I own. So it's the example that I can show you. This one was produced in 1976 by Fournier uh, in Spain, and Domenico Balbi was a Spanish artist who was interested in esotericism and tarot. So he must have seen, I'm guessing he was maybe influenced by El Gran Tarot Esoterico, but he must have seen something in the esoteric arrangement that he liked because he used it in his deck. So again, the aces kind of stand out a little bit differently and I'm gonna go through these um, in a slightly different way so you can see. Now for this comparison, I want to compare all of the aces, all of the twos, threes, and so forth because there are similarities across the numbers, and I appreciate that. So um, as per usual, though, the aces are a little bit different from the rest of the suit. So they're, they're special, and they're sort of just very decorative like this. So you can see that they are somewhat in the Mar Marseille tradition, and then to some degree also in this kind of esoteric uh, symbolism. Here on the coin, you have the 12 signs of the zodiac, and then you have a yin-yang in the middle. So he was clearly mashing up and borrowing from a lot of different sources. He also has a lot of astrology and Kabbalistic symbolism in his deck. Um, but here are twos, for example, and in every single card um, you have this uh, uh, above-below kind of arrangement, and this is also in Judas Picard's original in um, uh, many of his um, designs for the cards, but you have this sort of spherical shape on the bottom of the card that is different from the upper part or the background or the sky or whatever you want to call call that. You'll notice again that not all of the arrangements are very familiar or if they are somewhat familiar like this two of coins it's a little different. Normally you would have this ribbony vine root thing going around both coins and here it's just wrapped around it's balanced on the top of one and wrapped around the other. And all of this does have symbolism and meaning and I will link to some sources on uh, Mr. Picard, if you um, are interested in reading more about his approach. Um, I am certainly not an expert, nor I really think I want to be. I'm not going to study him in any great detail because like a lot of the esotericists and, you know, uh, 19th century occultists, he kind of rubs me up the wrong way. But I do think the symbolism um, is very interesting, and I think you could put your own sort of emphasis on the symbolism. So here you have three things going into the center in each of the cards, right? Three swords pointing into the middle, three wands pointing into the center, three cups emptying towards this spiral shape, uh, and three coins around this Masonic symbol in the middle. So you start to see some consistencies, not just in the way that the suits are arranged within themselves, but then among the suits, that they're all kind of following a similar pattern, which I appreciate because it, it just reinforces the idea that the numbers actually matter and they mean something. Uh, my next longer series is going to be on numerology in the Rider Waite Smith and how I kind of reconcile the images with the numbers, because in that 
deck in particular, and then decks that have been inspired by it, you don't get this kind of sim uh, symmetry or um, consistency, I feel. You get, you know, positive cards and negative cards and neutral cards all mixed together within a specific uh, number. And it's very confusing to me as to if you were going to number them something, why would a six sometimes be a bad card and sometimes be a good card, for example? So that is kind of how I look at it. Here you have a, pentac a pentacle or pentagram, sorry, um, in each of these. It's kind of implied in the uh, weapons suits here, but you can see this five shape with these straight lines. And then here it's actually drawn in in the two, the two other suits. So clearly some esoteric symbolism happening here. Here are our sixes. Again, some Kabbalistic symbolism. Uh, going on and what I find interesting also about this is that the swords in particular are very plain and everything else has a lot of decoration so I'm not quite sure I don't think that's explained in the booklet um, that comes with this deck so I'm not sure explain uh, what you know Senor Balbi was thinking about or whether he was making a lot of conscious decisions or whether he was just following the uh, Picard you know, look and feel and adding a lot of color. Um, that's one thing I do like about this deck very much is that it's very brightly colored and I enjoy that, the stimulation that gives me. Um, I'm not always in the mood for it, but when I am, it sort of perks me up and helps me pay attention. Um, I will say also that Dr. Picard originally switched the elemental associations of swords and cups. So he associates swords with water and cups with air, and hence you will see butterflies. There's butterflies in the original deck, and you'll see butterflies here as well. That makes no sense to me, and I believe actually was a mistake on uh, Picard's part that he actually didn't understand what the associations were and kind of got the wrong end of the stick and then ran with it. So it does make for a slightly weird elemental association if you follow that closely, but I kind of ignore that, and I just use my own associations as I normally would if I if I need to go into an elemental direction, I can. Um, but yeah, this is, I don't know. I, th I think it's very interesting the way that he's arranged all of these. Here you have in the nine, for example, you have the idea of a base of four and then five on top. So you see that repeated over and over here. I'm not going to make this video two hours long, so I won't tell you about every single symbol and, and similarity in these arrangements, but you can kind of get the idea just from looking at these, how they are are in fact similar. Interesting that the coins kind of stand out here, but I think he's doing some sort of, you know, wheel of the year, tree of life kind of thing over here. But these other ones kind of match up to each other. So that is the Judas Picard system as interpreted by Mr. Balbi, Domenico Balbi. Right. And for my last trick, as it were, I'll just show you some other representative kind of wild card arrangements of what I would call you know, DIY kind of thing. This is the uh, Dame Fortune's Wheel Tarot. It is originally by Paul Hewson, and it is still available in print from Los Carabeo. Um, and what he's done is he's mashed up the, the court cards are all famous uh, historic figures. So you have people like Hector, Rachel, Caesar, etc. The majors are from an early tarot deck that is known as the Charles VI deck. It's actually a misnomer. It has nothing to do with him. And then these minors are based on Atea's keywords. So they're sort of esoteric-y, but they're not Golden Dawn. And you'll see that reflected, like here the Four of Cups looks sort of more sorrowful than we're accustomed to. The Three of Cups does not have three women dancing on it. They're just their own kind of arrangements. So they're kind of hippish and they're also kind of scenic um, and they're a little bit different. Let's look at some more. So here we have our sword suit. Again, very different kind of scenes and then different kind of arrangements as well. We don't have the curvilinear or the overlapping uh, in the same way that we do. And then we get different kinds of, you know, stylized arrangements like this. So this is a bit of an outlier because it does have so many scenes, but it's also interesting to me the way that the, the pips kind of are arranged in their part of each card. 
and I like these um, these arrangements. There's some similar arrangements to these in the Pagan Otherworlds, I believe, in the coin suit in particular. So yeah, that's the Dame Fortune's Wheel. Another deck that blends historic and modern sensibilities is this uh, Inebi di Giovanni Vecchetta. This was published in 1893 in Italy. Originally published just as a black and white line art etching, and then this version has been colored in by Il Manigello. You can find your own version to color on my website at waterchildtarot.com. Vecchetta was a interior designer, and so he clearly studied tarot decks in order to make his own, but he didn't follow traditional Italian decks, French decks, entirely. He added his own kind of ruffles and flourishes. I love the bastoni. They're all about gardening and working outside. And he just did some interesting things with his illustrations for the pips that are different from other other card makers so here for example if you just if you took away all the flourishes and the the roses and things you would see this arrangement of pips is different from any of the other what is this the eight of cups that we've been looking at today so i like that he has kind of mixed together traditional and then his own flavor with kind of uh, these spheres of life approach you know bastoni are about exploration being outside working that kind of thing self-expression the cups are sort of about appreciation, feasting, celebration. The uh, denarii or the coins um, are all different kinds of things. And then the swords really are about weapons and battle, memento mori, sorrow, that kind of thing. So he's kind of put his own flavor on these for us. And I like, again, the difference um, between his uh, pip arrangements and then anyone else's because it just gives me that little boost when I'm feeling bored and of looking at the same old images over and over again. This one looks like a trophy cabinet to me, which is good for the Ten of Cups, I think. And you do get a few figures here and there, but they're sort of decorative uh, figures. Lots of musical instruments thrown in. So yeah, I really, I really like this. So that's Vachetta's approach to pips. Next, I'll show you one of my favorite modern decks. It's called the Polish Tarot. And again, it just does its own thing with the pip arrangements. So here's the Six of Cups, for example. They're not in two columns. They're just there. And while these are predominantly pip cards, you'll see that they have designs and little things in the background. So you do get a little bit of an extra hint or, you know, some symbolism to work with if you so choose to use it. And I, that's one of the reasons I like this deck. So you'll see some cards that are sort of Marseille-esque, like with these crossing uh, wands here in the eight. But then you get other ones that are very different, like this Four of Swords, for example. And even in the sword suit itself, you don't always have the same. So they're not always straight up and down. They're not always crossing. There's a mix. And I like that in this deck because it keeps me from getting bored. And finally, we have the Inspired Soul Tarot by uh, Julie of Peekaboo Rose, my most current uh, or contemporary acquisition. And I really appreciate her modern take. So she uses paintbrushes for the fire or uh, wand suit. She uses the uh, fountain pens for the air or sword suit. She uses wine glasses for the cups suit, uh, water suit, and then uh, her pentacles are buttons. And I love her choices here, but I also think her arrangements are really interesting because they kind of blend Marseille, traditional Marseille, with also a hint at maybe a little bit of an RWS meaning, like for example, this rough squiggle and then one pen coming between two groups in the five. So it sort of calls to mind that five of swords with uh, the defeat as uh, one of the images pictured there. 
Um, but I don't think they're all necessarily so literal, and I certainly think you can read these in an open way. You could use an open reading method or a Marseille type method to help guide you in reading these particular pips. And to me, they have the right balance of simplicity and being able to see what you're looking at, combined with a little bit of flourishes and interest to kind of capture your imagination or stimulate intuition. So another great set of choices with an alternative set of objects to arrange. I'm glad that there's no weapons here. And also just how she's gone about arranging these in a way that recalls other traditions, but at the same time doesn't rely on them completely. So you can read these really any way you'd like to. Um, that is my kind of survey, I guess, if you want, of different pip styles. And I would love to know if you have found any other parallels in your own collections between decks that depict different kinds of things. Have you noticed any parallels between, say, historic decks and modern ones? Or yeah, just let me know in the comments what you think. And until next time, be well, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.